All right, friends and relatives. Nista, big screen the hair on up CC. Nenaskum one. Can I ask him to know how he can do them? Take no one can knock. Perry Belgard Sega sell. Kuskatel Moskosis Oskunagun Treaty Four Territory, Southern Saskatchewan. My friends, my relatives, just a little bit in Cree. I'm happy to be here. I shake hands with each and every one of you in a humble, respectful way. My name is Perry Belgard, and I am from Little Black Bear First Nations, Treaty Four Territory, Southern Saskatchewan, and I'm the honorary president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society here. So welcome to this beautiful place, this wonderful place. Bienvenue à tous. This place here, you can see the water around us. And there are three wonderful rivers. Some of you know them in English. The Rideau River in Algonquin, Basa Bakitsuan, the Ottawa River, it's back here, Kichisipi, the Gatineau further down over here, Isa Gitnong. They converge here. And we all know the importance and relevancy of clean, clear water. Water is life. And one of the elders from Kitiganzi B, he's passed on now, William Kamanda, he used to always say this, is that the streams and the lakes and the waters that flow across Mother Earth and give life to Mother Earth are the same thing, just like the veins in your body that blood flows, that life blood flows through your body to give your, your body energy and life. It's the same thing with water. And so this is a special place, the importance and relevancy of water. It's life-giving. So again, welcome. Bienvenue à tous. I want to thank everyone for coming to the magic of mentoring conversation. And we are very grateful to CTV for broadcasting the conversation and a welcome to Vashi Kapalos, uh, for the chief political correspondent for CTV, who will be joining us later this hour to moderate the question and answer period with the audience. And now, it's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Joe McInnes. Of <laughs> He's a physician, a scientist, a legendary diver, a leadership expert, and a mentor to many people in this room, including Mr. James Cameron. James, a deep sea. <laughs> James is the, a deep sea explorer and Hollywood movie director and who will tell you that he makes movies so that he can go exploring. <laughs> they, <laughs> they are two of Canada's and the world's leading experts in deep sea exploration, and they are lifelong friends. So please join me again in welcoming Dr. Joe McInnes and James Cameron. I'm I'm going to start off by uh, thanking you, old friend, for coming all the way from New Zealand to join us here. And you have to know that his middle name is Loyalty. If you have been at his shoulder during the hard years in Hollywood or the thick adrenaline moments at sea, he never never forgets. So I think we should start off with a, an acknowledgement about the accident that occurred a month ago in the North Atlantic, the, the suffering of four families who lost husbands and sons, fathers and brothers, and our hearts go out to them in their great sadness and reflection. But as Perry mentioned, this is a fantastic place for so many reasons. This, this building, this room, is a celebration of, of exploration, discovery, and, and education. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about mentoring, the magic of mentoring, and who better 
to have a conversation with than the, the master of mentoring. Jim has, in his iconic movies, his epic deep sea exploration and, and his stunning documentary films, mentored us all, changed us all in our perceptions of the ocean. And so I think to kick this off, I'm going to tell a story that maybe you've, some of you have heard before, but it's the story of our first encounter. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to 1969. I was 32 years old. I was working in the United States as the medical director of Ocean Systems, the, the world's largest ocean engineering and undersea commercial diving company. Uh, we were the prime contractors for, for the uh, US Navy supervisor of salvage. We had commercial diving operations in the Gulf of Mexico, the Eastern Pacific, the North Sea. And at the time, I was a consultant to the US Navy Sea Lab 3 project. Sea Lab 3 was a $10 million undersea station designed to be home to small teams of elite Navy divers for weeks at a time at a depth of 200 meters. This is 1969. And I had the good fortune to work with Captain George Bond. George was uh, a naval officer. We, we called him Papa Topside because of our great affection for him, because it, he, took, he took such good care of us. But he was the father of saturation diving. He, uh, he mentored me in this very difficult period of my life when I was in San Francisco and then San Clemente Island trying to work as a civilian with these Marlin Spike elite Navy divers. And George would take me aside, he would encourage me, he would give me guidance. And, um, and so later that year, with a small grant from National Geographic, a team of, of uh, engineers and myself got together and built Sublimnos, which was Canada's first underwater station. It was designed to spend, and it did, two years beneath the surface of Lake Huron, where it was our kind of classroom and science center. But before it, uh, it went underwater, it was put on display outside the Royal Ontario Museum. And one Saturday morning, if I have it correctly, uh, a 14-year-old version of Jim got out of a car, walked across to the main entrance of the Royal Ontario Museum, looked over, and saw this station. It was five meters high. It had a ballast chamber. It had a living chamber. It had four windows and a skylight. He knew precisely what it was for. And he stopped, looked carefully, made a sketch. And that night, uh, Jim wrote me a letter. And he, he asked, the 14-year-old boy, asked me for blueprints because he wanted to build his own <laughs> station. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm reading this letter. And the, the passion in the words, words and the precision of the sentences and to be honest, the memory of George Bond and his encouragement and his, his guidance flashed to mind. And so I wrote you back. And I encouraged Jim to go ahead with, with his project. And well, he, he built his, his own little model, put a mouse inside it, <laughs> lowered the mouse into a river behind his home near Niagara Falls. And of course, the mouse survived. <laughs> and Traumatized. <laughs> and, and I've never forgotten this, because it, it stands out to me as a, as a, a 
memory of the fact that mentoring is magical because it moves information from one generation to the next, from George to me to Jim. And it's reciprocal mm -hmm. because there is an exchange, a lovely exchange between two paired minds trying to overcome uh, obstacles. And the other thing is that it has collateral benefits that you never really appreciate. And this is one of the collateral benefits. We're here today because of, uh, because of you and because of that small beginning. Yeah, because of you wrote me back. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, so think about over, that. To, over to you. Um, yeah. Well, imagine, you know, at 14, me getting that letter. And you know Joe's sto story is quite accurate. My mom used to take me to the to the ROM to, to the ROM to sketch dinosaur bones, Etruscan armor, whatever it was. And I saw Sublimnos and I sketched it, but it, it, it wasn't a gestural sketch. It was like I was trying to make my own blueprint because from the moment I saw it, I knew instinctively what it was for, more or less how it worked, and I wanted to build one and get in it. So I was drawing it to be as precise as possible. And uh, the sketch is actually on display, or at least a, a, a pretty good scan of it here. But imagine getting that letter and the empowerment of that. And it didn't end there, because then I wrote back and I said, all right, I'm having trouble. I can figure out the steel part of it. No, but I thought I could. <laughs> but how do you do the windows? And he sent me the address for a company uh, called at the time Roman Haas. Yeah. R-O-H-M and Haas. Um, and I think they had an office here in Canada. I think they're a German company. But, but um, so I wrote them a letter and I said, Dr. Joe McGinnis, the leading, <laughs> the leading oceanographer of Canada, has given me your, your information. And I said, I need, I need plexiglass for a, for a window for a submersible. And they sent me a sheet of plexiglass. It was just a sample about this big. And I had to figure out how to, steal, how to peel the back off it. And, and I thought, I've got the window. I'm halfway there. <laughs> but I did decide to do it in miniature first. So I got a mayonnaise jar and a paint bucket and some Tinker Toys. And I painted it all yellow. And I put the mouse inside it and lowered it down probably, I don't know, 25 feet into the Welland River. And uh, he got his feet wet a little bit, but, but he survived. And I called it Sea Lab 3 yeah. in my... Uh, <laughs> but, but think about the empowerment factor there. I think as a, a kid, in, uh, I, I grew up in a village of 1,500 people, Chippewa, in uh, what's now the greater Niagara Falls area. Um, I think it's been incorporated. But uh, I think there's still only 1,500 people there. But you don't think such amazing things are possible. I mean, I never could have imagined that I'd be a filmmaker in Hollywood. I never could have imagined that I'd actually work with deep submergence work, that I'd dive to Titanic, that I'd do all the other things. But when you have that moment of empowerment, when somebody believes in you, even though they, don't even, they haven't even met you, but they believe in you, they believe, all of a sudden the switch is thrown in your head and you believe it's possible as opposed to believing it's not possible. And I think there are so many kids in this world, probably more so now than ever, that just believe innately that it's not possible to get there from where they are. And it's so important. I think of, I, I had a, a meeting with some First Nations people earlier. We were talking about a kind of a screenwriting program or some, something like that. And, it, and that thought of empowerment really came to mind because there are so many so many kids in that world that really believe it's not possible. And all you gotta do is tell them it's possible. And then, and then they'll, they'll figure out a way over and past all the obstacles. Because somebody told them it was possible. You know? And it's all about perspective, it's all about outlook. And so, it's, I mean, I think anybody that, that's a parent has always told your kids, you can do it, you can do it, you know, you can score a goal. But you know, your kids learn to tune you out. It's really important for them to hear it from other people as well. And uh, teachers, the good ones, I think do that. 
Um, and you know, I think so. I've always I've always remembered that lesson. I also had a teacher in in high school, my biology teacher, who came up to me in the hallway once and, and put his hand on my shoulder and he said, hey, I just looked at your, uh, at your IQ test. And I said, oh crap, what, did I fail? And he said, you have unlimited possibility or unlimited potential and walked away. And I'm like, really, I have unlimited potential? It's like, okay, I got permission. Now I can go, <laughs> now I can go do all this stuff, right? And you only need to hear it from a couple of people if they're people that you respect. And it makes a huge, huge difference. So I've, I've remembered that. And I, I've tried to discipline myself as I work on small teams. And Joe, that wasn't the end of him, his mentoring role for me. Because Joe wound up as a, as a shipmate and a team member on a number of my expeditions, including to Titanic and ultimately even the, the one to Challenger Deep. And, you know, we'd have coffee and, and I'd say, what are you seeing in the, in the team? And he'd say, well, so-and-so looks like they're pretty stressed out. So-and-so is doing okay. So-and-so maybe needs a little uh, encouragement or something like that. And he was, he was still, he was teaching me leadership. Now, as an alpha dog movie director, expedition leader, you'd think I wouldn't need lessons in leadership, but of course you always do, you know? And, and uh, one of the most important lessons in leadership, I think, is followership. You have to, you have to imagine that you're the other person that you're, that you're talking to and imagine what it's like to follow an order or follow up, because I don't give recommendations, I give orders, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but how do you give it in a way that is encouraging and empowering to that person? And, and usually it can't be in order. It's like, is this something we can do? What do, you, what do you think? I've found the most powerful thing to say to anybody at any time is what do you think? It goes back to the, the message of Avatar, you know, I see you. People want to be seen. They want to be heard. You know, you don't have to do what they suggest, but even just asking them. And usually that leads to some kind of fertile conversation that solves the problem. And man, if you can incorporate something that they've suggested or proposed, even if they've seen it as a negative and you're turning it into a positive, that is empowerment for them. And, um, you know, I did another thing on, on in which you were witness to on the Deep Sea Challenge project. We had an 815 meeting every morning. And I, I said it 8.15 the same way shrinks do it on the quarter of the hour. So you're not, you're not early or late, right? It's not generic. It's not 8 o'clock. It's 8.15. And it was a, we had a small team, and I do believe in small teams, and I believe in what I call total radical transparency. You get everybody around a table. It was our entire engineering team, so it was electrical and, and mechanical and, and all systems. It's 12 people. And every morning at 8.15, you put your problems on the table because people don't do that. They sidebar, everybody sidebars because they don't want to be, they don't want to have to admit that they're struggling or that there's something that they can't solve. And that's how things become infections that, that run out for ages and ages before they come to light. And then it turns into a big disaster. Everybody's running around with their hair on fire. It took me a couple weeks to get everybody used to the idea. But once they realize that you put your problem on the table, somebody around the table is going to have an answer or they're going to have some spare bandwidth and they're going to help out because people naturally want to help out. They're not, they're not competitive. We're all there to do the, the same thing. So I was, I was working through my, you know, growing understanding of how to do this. And I had Joe coaching me the whole time. And I just hope you can come on the next one. Well, absolutely. I'll be there. <laughs> um, um, It's interesting you say that you, you, you have this capacity to create circles of safety yeah. for us to... Safety, to, that's critical, to, absolutely. To challenge you, I yeah. mean, to, to yep. feel comfortable yep. coming up and saying, Jim, that's not going to work. Yep. Have you thought of this? And, and that's a rare quality in, in a leader. Um, I wanted to give the audience a sense of um, some of your qualities. And I, I go back to 2003. The Aliens of the Deep expedition. Oh, well, I, we were on Aries. 
Yes, if I've got this correct, it was a seven million dollar Disney sponsored project, and um, your objective. Would have been if we'd stayed on budget. <laughs> <laughs> your your objective was to. We had two ships, four subs, 130 people from I think five universities and NASA, mm -hmm. and your objective was to go through the Atlantic and Pacific, where we made 40 dives investigating volcanic vent systems and their, their bizarre communities of life. And I remember one sunny morning north of the Azores when we were on the ship together and we were launching two subs over the stern and we had the first sub in the air when the hydraulic crane froze. I mean, there we were, hundreds of miles away from the nearest land, no way to fix the crane, no way to get the subs in or out of the ocean. And we were all, we were all kind of on that sun-baked deck looking at our shoelaces saying, that's it, we're screwed. Everything ground to a screeching yeah. halt. And, but, but you, you were kind of going around the deck and looking around at the equipment, you huddled with the deck crew and then you, you, uh, you took your sketch pad and he disappeared. He went up to the bridge and you came back down, I think about uh, two hours later, and you got us together and you said, here's how we're going to solve the problem. We're going to modify a mid-deck cargo crane so that we can launch over the side of the ship instead of the stern. We're going to re-rig the capstans and the winches to control the sub. And we're going to cut a hole the size of a school bus in the side of the ship <laughs> so we can get the subs over the side. This is true. And talk about silence. <laughs> Jesus. I'm looking over at Captain Dennis. Yeah. And Captain Dennis is just shaking his head. I think the tears were coming to his <laughs> eyes. And he said, but you never ever cut a hole in the side. But he said, you know, my crane failed. Just promise to put it back. And so three days later. a great later, scene in the film too, with those blow torches yeah, cutting yeah. out <laughs> 40 feet of the side of the ship. Um, <laughs> three days later, after tests and failures and more tests, smashed fingers, bruised ribs, we finally figured out a way to get the subs into and out of the ocean. And, and this meant that you could have that extraordinary four sub rendezvous on the peak of a submerged mountain, uh, which was a fabulous scene in the film. And for, for the NASA, NASA scientists on board, uh, was a kind of simulated mission to Mars. So my question, I'm sorry, it's a long way to get this. But, <laughs> this is 100% true, by the way. But, but We put it back also, uh, yeah. just for the record. <laughs> um, your fierce ingenuity, your radical thinking, your radical lateral thinking, where does that come from? What kind of thinking um, makes that possible? Well, I always say on a, on a film set, so you might shoot a film for 80 days, 100 days, 160 days. Depends on the film. Titanic was 160 days. Every day you come in, as you're driving in, you're thinking, all right, what's going to go wrong? And what's my backup plan? And what's my backup backup plan? Because I guarantee you by 9 a.m. you're going to be through plan one, plan two, and you're going to be on plan, plan three at, at that point. So it's contingency thinking before the fact. But in that one, I didn't have a contingency for the, for the A-frame failing. So that was literally a very quiet moment. Um, but you know, I, I think it's just um, some degree of experience and some degree of, of will and some degree of, I, I, do, I do feel that, that all of the film work has given me a, a, like a, a sniff test for what is possible versus what isn't possible. And I can't quite quantify where that comes from. But you kinda, when somebody tells me an idea, I can kind of know it's going to work or kind of know it's not going to work. And I'll somehow 
I'll, I'll be able to hear the showstoppers within it. So then the conversation doesn't go to, you know, that's crazy, we're not doing that. It goes to, yeah, but what about this? What about that? And before you know it, you've taken two or three steps down that path, and pretty soon you're doing the crazy thing that somebody else may have proposed. But I, I can't quantify it. I, I do think that the human brain works in a, in a rational, Cartesian, linear way that could be expressed, you know, kind of by, by some kind of equation, very, maybe a very complex quadratic equation or whatever, but I also think there's another level of the human brain that works like a quantum computer that can have a whole bunch of uncollapsed superpositions that suddenly collapse into a picture. And I think our brains do work that way. I think we work at both a, a, a linear, rational level, and not as much as we think we do, by the way. And I think we also have this ability to sort of free associate with all of these, all of these variables simultaneously and then come to a conclusion. Some people call it instinct, but I think it's the most powerful form of, of human computation that we have. And by the way, any, anybody that, that's worried about AI being better than us, you can have a conversation with a chat bot and it sounds kind of human but it's an acre of processors take pulling 10 to 20 megawatts. It probably weighs several thousand tons. And we're doing it with three pounds of meat. So when they have that kind of mobility, and, and maybe 20 watts, like a dim light bulb, when they have that kind of mobility and flexibility and ability to project uh, our, our sensory and, and cognitive apparatus anywhere we want to go, anytime we want to go. Then talk to me about who's superior. Uh, you have just confirmed what I've known for many years, that you have synapses in places where we don't have places. I think we all, I think we all have it, Joe. I think we all have it. Okay. I think there's a certain element of, of luck and circumstance that you get to play in a, a sandbox, in a scenario, with a bunch of other talented people, and, and that fires more, yes, right? And I think some people don't, once again, I go back to that empowerment thing. Some people don't know that they can do, <laughs> there's a kid out here in a helmet waving. Um, <laughs> some people don't know they can do it, so they never put themselves in that situation. So I think, you know, one thing that explorers have in common is there has to be a certain degree of boldness. Yes. And there has to be a certain degree of caution. You know, otherwise you don't come back from the pole. Yeah. Um, another little story I think would be interesting to all of the nice folks here is in 19, sorry, uh, 2010, uh, the BP well blowout. Oh, Deepwater Horizon, yeah. Yeah, Deepwater Horizon. And, and it occurred, uh, the rupture of an 18-inch pipe at 1,500 meters, it was uh, devastating to the Gulf of Mexico. And they tried to cap the well. Yeah, several different ways. Several different ways. Failed. And at some point, you said, I want a group of you to come to Washington We'll spend a day at the EPA building, and we're going to brainstorm this issue, and we're going to offer our best information um, to the options on how to solve this problem. And you selected your team very carefully. These were marine scientists, engineers, uh, oil field specialists. But, um, and then we came up with this paper. Um, mm -hmm technical options to control the BP well, yeah, yeah. which 20, you sent off to... 28 page white paper. And I've always been impressed with that as a, as a as a personal leadership, as an expression of someone who saw a problem, who stepped right up, covered all the costs, made sure it happened, and then produced this result. So I'm and curious. You were, you were a participant in that. Well, and, you, was, and was, I think you knew everybody in the room. We all knew each other in a, in a, in a sense because most, I think everyone had been at depths mo deeper than 1,500 meters. So we sure. were all thinking from inside the ocean. Which, yes, right, exactly. That but was the I'm, key. 
I'm curious if you could share your thoughts about why you felt so strongly and and reacted in such a positive mm. leadership way. Well, sometimes you're just filling a vacuum. I mean, we all, we all watched day after day the, the, the camera that they ran on CNN as it was just dumping hundreds of thousands of gallons daily. And you're just thinking that, you know, in the pit of your stomach, you're feeling what's happening to the ecosystem there in the Gulf of Mexico. And you're just staring in horror as this thing just progressed. And they'd try one thing and they tried something else and then they tried something else. And some of the things they were trying, you know, when they put that, put that cap over it, that big kind of conical cap. Well, anybody that knows anything about pressure and water and, and, and methane would know that it was immediately going to form these clathrate ices and clog the thing off. Anybody would know that, right? So I, I don't even understand why they tried that. But I thought, smarter people than me, I'm not involved. And then I watched for another few days. And finally, I just said, you know what, screw it. I've got to these guys need some perspective from outside of their oil patch bubble of reality. They know ROVs and they know their pro processes and there's a lot of smart engineers there, I'm sure. But we do deep submergence too in a very different way. We get in it and we go down there and we work on site with a vehicle, with arms and so on. And we, I think we have a better situational awareness. And, you know, I, I, I basically by that point, because I'd done the abyss and I'd done the Titanic dives and all that sort of thing and, and done a number of expeditions by that point, I think seven expeditions, I knew everybody. I, it's a small community. So it was one of the, one of the men that died in the sub recently, P.H. Nargile, the legendary French submersible pilot. I called PH, I called Anatoly Sagalevich from the Russian Academy of Sciences, who I dove with in the, the Mir subs. You know, Joe McGinnis, of course, and a, a number of others, Phil Newton, the, the, you know, Canada's, I think, leading deep submergence vehicle developer. He just died recently, unfortunately, um, out in BC. And, um, you know, a bunch of other people. I've, I, I contacted NOAA, the, the, which is, uh, you know, oceanic atmospheric, you know, science in, in, in the US, the EPA, US EPA, the White House and the Secretary of Energy. And I said, we're gonna do this and it'll be advisory to you, won't cost you a dime. The EPA offered to host it and we got everybody convened in a room and we just started talking. And I brought in a guy I didn't know named Kim Hadfield who was an oil patch guy. He really knew, he really knew his wells. He really knew, he got the information. He talked to some Deepwater Horizon engineers. He got the information about what casing, what drill string, what size of casing, all the different gradations. And he was able to characterize the whole scenario for us. And we sat in that room or walked around, talked. Uh, I think, Andy, you were there too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you remember this vividly. We had the whiteboards and everybody was beaming in. And, um, and there was one point mid-afternoon where I said, nobody's leaving this room until we have something on this whiteboard that we all believe in. And then that's what the paper is going to be based on. So then we went around and around again. But the crazy thing is, we came up with a conclusion. And it was kind of a crazy conclusion. But I, I took all the notes. I, we wrote it all up into a white paper. And we sent it off to the White House and the EPA and the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, Department of Energy. And the conclusion was, do top kill again, but with back pressure. Add a flange, cut the top off, add a flange, and then do, do, the, do the, kill, the junk shot again with X PSI of back pressure. And quit experimenting around with a bunch of other crap. And that's, that was the best thing. And so we never heard back. Never heard a word, never even had a word of acknowledgement because we had suddenly become radioactive because we gave government an option. And if they had taken that option, even if it would have saved millions of, of barrels of oil going into the Gulf, had they failed, they'd have had a big target painted on their back as opposed to a big target painted on BP's back. EPA never answered. They hosted us, they, they, they approved us then they never even acknowledged that they received it, any of the four entities. And guess what happened next? Big fat nothing for 60 days of it pouring millions of gallons a day. And then what happened? They repeated, they repeated um, top kill.
with back pressure, and it worked. Now, I happen to believe that they didn't get that idea from us. I happen to believe they figured it out for themselves, and they never actually read the paper because by that point we were radioactive, but we were right. And none of us had ever worked on an oil well in our lives. Well, that's not true. Phil Newton had. Yeah. But we knew deep ocean technology. So we were trying to vector in from an angle on help them solve their problem. And I think it was a, it was a perfectly valid exercise. And so I think this is where I think a lot of, obviously, bureaucracies and governments and, and big corporations fall down, that they can't accept. It's that thing that, that you were talking about, creating a safe place for people to have ideas and have a different perspective. Yeah. So anyway, that's another story. <laughs> I don't think I quite answered your question no, about what, what possessed me to do it. It's like, well, sometimes you just see a need. Sometimes you just see a need and you've got you've to act. I mean, I think that's what filmmaking is all about. You see, you see something that you want to communicate that you think people may want to, to see and hear, and you go do it. Nobody's telling you to go do it. You know. um, I apologize. I'm going to rudely interrupt. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm following I, orders. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> uh, I'm just here to moderate the, the Q&A portion from the audience. So I wanted to let everybody know if you do have a question, there is a microphone over there so you can head over. Um, and in the interim, I get to ask a, a brief question of each of you uh, from myself. And, and I thought I'd start off, uh, Mr. Cameron, just asking you, you talk about boldness, um, having a sniff for what's possible. Uh, I'm wondering how much of what you ended up pursuing, what we're going to see in the exhibit below, you attribute to an innate sense of that versus the fact that Dr. McInnes actually wrote you back in 1969. I think it's both. I think, I think, I think people, who, people who believe in you is an absolutely critical thing at that, at that young age. Once you've done a few things, you, you can start to believe in yourself. But people who actually say out loud, you know, that they that they believe in in you being able to do something is absolutely critical. And you know, I find that I that I do that a lot. And sometimes I'll give people a shot, and I'll be in the back of my mind. I'm thinking they may not be ready for this. But you know what? They're I'm never going to know, and they're never going to know, unless it, in a way it's empowering. At the same time, it's also challenging. You know, and I think there's a certain type of person who steps up to a challenge. I know that on the submersible projects, actually all the expedition projects, the people that were attracted to it were the people that wanted challenge. They actually wanted, they wanted to challenge themselves. And I think you, you want to see that. I call it the eye of the tiger. You want to look at somebody and see that they're, they're there because it's hard. Did you have that sense, Dr. McInnes, when you read that original letter? The eye, well, you saw the eye of the tiger, or are you just being a nice person? No, no. Um, but just to, to uh, echo what Jim just said, some people have this will to get it done no matter what. That fire burns, and it burns deeply, and you, you can sense it in people. It's, so it, and it is a combination of, of, uh, of, you know, these outside influences and this kind of fire inside to to really push your limits. Okay, we'll start with uh, a question from the floor over there. Hi, um, Mr. Kamen and uh, Dr. McGinnis. Uh, kind of a bit of two for one to start. Um, hopefully I'm being picked up by the mic, but I'll uh, try to project either way. But um, how did you two collaborate on your expedition or expeditions to Titanic? And then Dr. McGinnis, would you say you led him to that project? Sorry, what was the last question? Uh, would you say you led him to the project of the expeditions to the Titanic? It was a factor because yeah. we, we met physically apropos of the abyss originally. And because I, I went to people who were leaders in <coughs> deep submergence for real when I wrote that. And, and I... I met Joe for the first time because we had corresponded years and years earlier. So this would have been in 1988. Yeah. And then the abyss, which was all simulated in a tank using real submersibles and real robotics, but in shallow water. After I had done that, I thought, I think we can do this for real. I think we could really do this in the deep ocean. I get it now. I get how the technology works. And then Joe was involved in, a, in an expedition for a film, not my film, a film called Titanica, which actually premiered 
right just Here. down the river. In, it was in Hull, I think, it right? It was in the museum in Hull, 1992, and uh, we were having our world premiere, and we invited you to come uh, see the IMAX story and to meet the Russians, which he did. He met Anatoly. Right, so you can't get more Canadian than that. You got a Canadian filmmaker, you got the Canadian filmmaker that made Titanica, Stephen Lowe, you got the Canadian format of IMAX. We're meeting in, meeting in Hull with, with uh, Dr. Joe, uh, and then the, there were some Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but they had the subs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The... <laughs> All right, we'll take the next question. Hi, my name is Norman. I'm a new Canadian citizen from Mauritius. So ocean exploration is something that hits really close to home. So thank you for this very inspiring talk. Sorry, where are you from? Mauritius. Oh, yeah, wow. sure. Yeah, so ocean exploration takes it as very close to home. So this well, was very you got inspiring. Ocean all around you there. Exactly. So I was wondering, what is a piece of advice you would give to a young explorer and what path would you put them on for their success? Uh, well, that's a tough one. I mean, it's never, it's like filmmaking. It's never been easy to, to break in. It's not any easier now than it, than it ever was. Um, but I think you just have to follow your passion if it's engineering or if it's the science. There are different paths into it. I mean, it's kind of too late for us to round up some stalwart huskies and go bobsledding up to the North Pole. <laughs> and, you know, most exploration these days is pretty high tech. So I would say a, a technical approach is, a, is definitely a good way in, um, whether it's uh, imaging, acoustic imaging, if you're interested in the ocean, or whether it's on the science side, marine biology or, or physical oceanography, um, you know, get into it. And then, and then, you know, don't pursue the academic side of that as much as wanting to do the field work and the sampling and get yourself out on a ship and see, kind of see how it's done. Thank you very Andy, much. wouldn't you say that's that? Yeah. Right, go to Woods Hole. Call them. Put in your application at Woods Hole Oceanographic. <laughs> Dr. McInnes, I, I just wanted to quickly follow up on that question um, and ask if you started off by acknowledging what happened with Titan last month, and, and I'm wondering from your perspective if you're concerned at all about the public nature with which that all unfolded, how gripped we all were, and the awful outcome, obviously, and if it will have any kind of potential effect on people like a 14-year-old who might want to endeavor into deep sea exploration, if you're worried at all about that. She's not asking me, because she already, already asked did, me this yeah. five <laughs> times. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I've, I'm not a, a technical expert. I, I know a little bit about psychology, and I do believe that the Titan accident was a failure of technology, but it was also a failure of psychology a failure of leadership, a failure of the leadership of OceanGate to have empathy for the team, the task, the technology, the Their ocean. Their responsibility. Yeah. And Their responsibility to the people in the sub, which means empathy for the families of the people Absolutely. in the sub. Absolutely. And, and there was so much magical thinking going on about, uh, you know, carbon fiber is safe, don't need uh, a certifying agency to help you make your subs safer. Repeated dives to the Titanic means that your, your sub is invincible. All of that was going on. And so, uh, so I think we've got to be very careful. You forgot humility as well. Yeah, you know, How can you dive Titanic without, without remembering the fundamental lesson of, uh, lesson of the history of Titanic? which is hubris. human arrogance and, and hubris. Yeah. Pride goeth before fall. So now there's two wrecks sitting side by side. I believe there's still some of the wreckage down there from the sub. And they both are there for exactly the same reason, the human propensity to believe your own narrative and your own invincibility and not be humble before the environment. If you're going into space, you have to be humble before what space is and how daunting that is. If you're going into the deep ocean, you have to be humble before the force of water, the pressure, you know, the, the, the uh, innate challenges of, of, that, of that world and not be arrogant. And I think that, you know, look, I get, the, I get the desire to want to innovate. I get the desire to want to push the boundaries with new technology. But you have to understand, the second that you, go, that you deviate from tried and true ways of doing things, you have to be doubly rigorous. And they, they clearly were not. 
Um, so I think it's a lesson of, about, about psychology, it's very much so, and, and leadership. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one final question from the audience. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for this very special conversation. You know, it's often argued that so much of the world has already been explored, and yet the, the ocean is, has been largely undocumented. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the most critical areas for exploration and deepening our collective understanding about the ocean? And what is your hope or blueprint for ocean conservation looking ahead? All right, now, when I got, just got back from the Challenger Deep, I would have answered that question differently than I do right now. At that time, I would have said, if you add up all the Hadal trenches, those trenches that are below 6,000 meters in depth, they total an area greater than the United States. And very, very little is known about what's down there. But I think we face certain existential risks as a species right now, having grabbed the tiller of how life works on this, on this planet and changing it so rapidly. I look at it very differently now. I think we need to understand the upper water column much more than the deepest areas. We need to understand what's happening in the relationship between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and dissolved in the ocean, acidification. How, how much carbon is, is being pulled out by life in the ocean, the phytoplankton, you know, in sunlight, they photosynthesize, they draw carbon dioxide out. The flux going into the ocean, we need to understand more. How is, how is that affecting what's happening down in the twilight zone? We have the largest mass migration of biomass on the, on the planet going up and down, going up to feed at night, coming back down during the daytime as those animals millions of tons of them die and their bodies sink to the bottom, they're pulling carbon out permanently down into the depths. And it's very hard for us to characterize what's happening in that three-dimensional water column because radio waves don't penetrate it, any kind of electromagnetic radiation. You have to use sound or you have to go take samples and you have to take measurements in situ. So we can have a, a Doppler radar satellite, a weather satellite, takes a snapshot of everything that's happening in the atmosphere pretty quickly, like one 90-minute revolution of the Earth, and you know what's going on in the atmosphere. That same thing, we, we simply cannot do it, because by the time you've, you've studied you know, all the different points in the water column with the, with the tragically low funding that we have for the kinds of vehicles and instruments that we need to deploy down there, it's changed already. It might take you five years to get there, 10 years to get the equivalent of that one single orbit snapshot of the atmosphere to understand what's happening in the water column. And then 10 years from now, it's, it's all changed. So time series, we need instrumentation that's out there, that's in place, that's in situ. We need roving vehicles and instruments that move up and down in the water column to get a, a picture, to understand. So here's an example. People didn't understand the role of seagrass. Seagrass was just kind of always there. People were focused on coral reefs, they were focused on twilight zone, they were focused on other problems. It turns out that seagrass is the biggest sink for carbon in the oceans. And we're destroying it with coastal development and so on. Same thing with, with mangroves and other, other kind of coastal uh, ecosystems. That's what we need to understand. It's all the stuff that's up near the surface that we need to understand because that's what is interfacing with our world that affects us and the oxygen that we breathe, the carbon di dioxide that's causing the fires. Why, by the way, why is Canada getting blamed for every frickin' forest fire <laughs> out there? <laughs> it just ain't right. We got plenty of forest fires down in California and all through the Midwest as well. No, it's those Canadians. <laughs> they don't know how to manage their forests. Anyway, so you see, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex problem of really understanding the things that are going to affect us and the outcome of our civilization. So it's not as sexy an answer because it's not about going deeper or d discovering some new species way down in a trench. That stuff's cool, I love that. Uh, but I don't think that's where we need to be putting our money right now. Andy, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Understanding the ocean from a volumetric perspective. Volumetric perspective, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, critical. It, it, if I can, I, I agree with everything that you say, but I'd like to go back to what you said to us earlier. If we're going to have a conversation with the ocean in science and engineering, it has to be done with reverence. Mm -hmm. It has to be un done with a great love of 
the gift of water and, and it, our relationship. So it has to be done with reverence. Yeah, well, we're water, we're walking water. You know, our blood's the same salinity as, as seawater. We, you know, way back, way the hell back when we, we emerged out of, out of the ocean. And we don't respect, we don't respect the mother, the mother of all life. And, uh, you know, we're killing her off. That's what, you know, I make movies about that idea too. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, cut the questions off there. I apologize. I know there's a few of you who had your hands up. I'm very sorry. Um, I'd like to invite now, though, the CEO of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society to the stage, John Geiger. Thank you, Vashi. And wow, what a thought-provoking discussion. And most of all, thank you to Dr. Joe McGuinness and James Cameron for such revealing uh, insights and conversation. Good afternoon, your excellencies, your honor, governors of, and fellows of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society uh, and distinguished guests. Since 1929, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society has championed a deeper knowledge of Canada and an appreciation of its immense geography. The society has a long history of supporting exploration and scientific expeditions to Canada's furthest reaches from its tallest peaks to the deepest ocean depths, fostering a spirit of discovery, education and, and conservation. James Cameron exemplifies that spirit and that's why today we're honoring Jim with the society's gold medal, recognizing individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the field of geography and who have helped make Canada better known to Canadians and to the world. Past recipients of the gold medal include the great geophysicist T. Sir J. Tuzo Wilson, the author Margaret Atwood, actor and explorer Sir Michael Palin, astronaut Dr. Roberta Bondar, legendary broadcaster and naturalist Sir David Attenborough, and of course, Dr. Joe McGuinness. Um, so to quote from this citation, Few have such intimate knowledge of the ocean as James Cameron. The explorations he has undertaken with deep sea challenger to the deepest trenches of the ocean have been instrumental in terms of research, but also inspirational in showing us a part of this earth that most will never see. Having experienced these exceptional environments, Cameron is a passionate advocate for sustainability, founding the Avatar Alliance Foundation to take action on climate change, indigenous rights and ocean conservation. The Royal Canadian Geographical Society is proud to award the gold medal to James Cameron for his outstanding contributions to the exploration of the ocean and his commitment to environmental sustainability. Now I'd like to welcome Chief Perry Bellegarde, our honorary president, um, and also um, the Honorable Lois Mitchell, board president of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, to come forward to present Jim Cameron with this honor. Congratulations. Oops, I'm still wired. Let me wrap this around the next person. Okay, all right. And then she'll present you the gold medal. Oh, five, five. Thank you, Chief Belgard. I'll go as far as I can go. Oh, that's good. You stand there. Let me face the crowd. Okay. We'll do it this way. Is that the right way? It looks pretty good. Pretty good? Yep, that's it. I'm glad I wore black. It really yeah, shows yeah, it off. So All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Thank you for all your time. I appreciate it. And you represent my very favorite quality in life, which is adjustability, and you got in space. So there you go. Oh, look at that. Wow. That's it. All right. Wow. This is quite an honor. All right, she got the shot. Thank you so much again. All right, thank you, Chief. Here's your. Uh, oh, that's for this. That's for right. The, uh, okay. Well, I kind of said everything I think <laughs> of any intelligence for the moment, but I I just want to acknowledge what an incredible honor this is, and to be honored in my my homeland of Canada from the the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, that's that's really something, Joe. You know, I mean, we don't do this for medals, right, or honors, or, or for moments like this. I mean, we obviously deeply appreciate 
when people pay attention to the work that we do, but we do it because of just a burning curiosity to just go and see, I call it bearing witness. I think it's the difference between imagining or maybe doing science in a lab and feeling compelled to just go and look. And, um, and when you can't find a reason not to is when you have to. You know, it's the craziest thing. And I'll think, that'd ah, be great to go to the Challenger Deep, you know? And then it's like, that thought didn't go away. It's three days later, I'm still thinking about it, you know? So then I'm sitting around on an expedition. We've just been down to the Bismarck wreck at 16,000 feet and congratulating ourselves on working almost at the absolute depth limit of the, the Russian submersibles and coming back with our lips blue because we've been down for 16 hours freezing in, this, in these subs and thinking we've really accomplished, accomplished something. And then, and then I say to everybody, yeah, but it's only halfway. <laughs> <laughs> what would that look like? And then you got a bunch of smart people around a table and you, all of a sudden it just erupts into the ideas start to flow. And, and we were just talking about this before. There's a moment where it kind of comes into your head how to do it, and then I can't not do it. It's the cr craziest thing. I can't not do it. Sometimes I'll put it on the back burner for a while and go make a movie, but because you've got to pay for this stuff somehow. <laughs> But anyway, so th this, is, this, is an, this is an honor, and I will, I will cherish this. I'm going to wear this a lot. Do you think, <laughs> you think it's ostentatious? Totally I don't, normal to walk I, around home. I, I, yeah. yeah, I think sure. it's not a big ostentatious <laughs> one. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to wear this all the time. Drive my kids crazy. But anyway, the point is we don't do, do this for the accolades. I think the people that do this are serious and disciplined and, and they, they just want to know. And that curiosity also is representative of science itself, the whole methodology of science and the meaning of science itself. I don't profess to be, to be a, a scientist with degrees. I think of myself more as a science groupie. I, I build the machines that give the scientists themselves access. But I'm you know, deeply devoted to the process of science. and, uh, and the things that we do hopefully inspire young people to think about science as a process, as a way to get past disinformation and misinformation and opinion and opinion mongering and fear mongering and all that to it, an actual method that gets you to a truth that everyone must agree on. And there's nothing else quite like it in, in human civilization except the scientific method, and I believe in it. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And once again. And, and, and just as yeah, we got to stand. Go ahead. <laughs> Congratulations once again, and thank you to both you, Mr. Cameron, and Dr. McInnes for, I think it's just so nice to attend something where you leave actually feeling inspired and feel the sniff of possibility mm. and the desire to be bold. So thank you very much for imparting that on all of us, and thank you everyone uh, who attended today. I just want to remind you.